let's go back into chronology. How do how do you and and people <coughs> decide to throw your lot together? The way he tells it, he <coughs> pursued you and would not let you get away from him. But what's the truth about how you guys? You seem like an unlikely one. Of, I see this record as like a Wagnerian, odd, you know, buddy comedy. You know, the yeah, that's between good. these two really unlikely guys from different backgrounds. Totally. How did you throw your lot together? Uh, I don't know how he sees it. It was actually a very natural thing that we had him, he got him in this play, What Do You Deserve? And I was just astounded by his talent and his voice. And it was great for me to write for and to create for. And we started talking about doing a record. And neither of us knew really what that meant. But um, I started writing songs. I never had to change my style of songwriting. It's just that it probably became more specific because I knew who I was writing for. And there was, um, there was a physical embodiment of what I was thinking of. Uh, but I don't remember him pursuing me. I mean, he was very determined as I was. So in a sense, probably, I probably was thinking of a lot of things, films and theater. And he might have, because he was so determined, strengthened my resolve to maybe try records because that's what he wanted to do more than anything. So together we really became sort of obsessed with doing a record. And um, I, that's my recollection, it was more evolved together, that we both became more and more focused on doing a record. After we did that show at the New York Shakespeare Festival, uh, we did the National Lampoon Show on tour. That had been an amazing show I had seen. John Belushi started there, who was one of Meet's best friends. And um, I became musical director. And uh, we toured with that, and while we were touring, I was writing. And that was a good experience, too, to, to just go around. And that, that had a lot of influence to me in other ways, too. Um, I could see how audiences reacted to Meet Love, not just in the show More Than Deserve, but in this show where he played like 20 different characters and skits. Uh, they would chant his name at the end. Um, and it, it was partly made me realize what a great name it was. <laughs> um, to hear a, a whole college, it was mostly the colleges we played, a whole college crowd of like 1,500 people who had never seen him before, heard of him, at the end going, me, love, me, love. It was very cool. And also, it was a very blasphemous, irreverent show. I mean, much went much further than Saturday Night Live could ever go. And um, it was exciting to me to see extreme audience reaction, too. I remember a lot of really extraordinary gigs we played. The, my favorite was, we, for whatever reason how they booked it, we played like a bunch of gigs in the Bible Belt of um, Pennsylvania, strangely enough. It wasn't, like, you think of the Bible Belt as the Deep South, but there's an extraordinarily intense Bible Belt in Pennsylvania. And they booked like four shows in a row at these intensely Christian Bible schools. I don't know why, but it was the one I really remember vividly was, um, they had just won their football game or something. It was a Saturday night. They were, it's typical for a Bible school. They were drunk beyond belief. They were the rowdiest audience I've ever known. And we had an absolutely viciously sacrilegious crucifixion sketch. Uh, sketch in the uh, show and in the middle of it they started chanting the Lord's Prayer in anger like and it was one of the most fascinating things to hear about 900 people mostly it seemed like the jocks of the school violently going our father who art in heaven like and they were throwing bottles and I remember they threw a bottle that knocked the top of the piano down it was raised up with a stick and it hit the stick that holds the top up and the piano almost came crashing down on my fingers and I just walked off I figured. And early on, in this sort of love-hate relationship that collaborators tend to have, any sort of collaborator, uh, what was the percentage of love and hate early on? You know, it's funny. To me, it was never a love and hate thing. I mean, my memory of it with me, love, is it was always very much <clears throat> two guys working together. who um, We were never incredibly close. But I, on a personal level, I think I can honestly say with maybe one or two tiny exceptions over 30 years, I never even had a huge problem with Meatloaf personally. The real problems came with problems he had with his voice or with problems with his management, lawyers, that I stayed away from. I just didn't get involved. Um, I, and at that time particularly, there weren't really any problems. I mean, my biggest problem then was that, uh, was with David Sonnenberg in that originally it wasn't Meatloaf, it was Meatloaf and Jim Steinman. Uh, we were a duo in the sense, a different kind, but it was, it was for two, th two and a half, three years, we were working as Meatloaf and Jim Steinman, like whole knows. So I was stunned because David was his manager, and when we got to CBS to sign the record deal, I remember it was a big table, like 12 people, 
and the president, Walter Yetnikov, was at one end, and they sent the contract around to be signed. And it went by me. I wasn't there to sign it. I remember being surprised. I said, hey, wait, I, I didn't get to sign it. I said, well, you're not in it. And that was the first I found out that they had taken my name off. And um, I think Meat probably thinks this had a more profound effect on me than, than it did, but maybe it did have that profound effect. I just remember being really startled and sort of shattered, just because in my mind it was a very cool thing to have this combination of a songwriter, pianist, and a singer. I didn't know of any example of that, and I thought it was really cool. Um, it was the reason all of our auditions were just piano and, and him. It was what we intended the whole thing to be, a piano in the center of the stage, and it would be like that. And uh, David's reasoning was that he thought it was easier to sell with the name Milov. I didn't agree with him, but I also mainly was upset that I didn't know about it. So it wasn't about me. And to Milov's great credit, he was wonderfully loyal. He, uh, I actually eavesdropped, without him knowing it, a uh, studio in New Jersey. We were working on Bad of the Hell. And he got on the phone to David in tears and pleaded with him to put the credit back to where it was because he didn't feel comfortable with it being only Meatloaf, which is an interesting seed to a bigger story. I still believe, honestly, had it kept the original credit, I suppose this is a little self-serving, but I don't mean it that way, I think Meat would have had a much easier time over the last 30 years. Because one thing Meat will admit to, I'm sure, is he, he'll constantly say, I never wanted to be a star. I'm not comfortable being a star. And he had a lot of breakdowns and problems, which I think had a lot to do with it was just his name. He felt much more comfortable when it was the two of us because we shared the burden. And he wasn't the person who had to come up with the creative work. He didn't have to write the stuff. I think when he felt his name was there, because you know how the audience is. The audience thinks actors make up their lines. They think the singer, to this day, a lot of people think Meatloaf wrote the songs. That proved to be a great burden on him, and I think taxed everything. I still, to this day, honestly believe, had it been billed as a duo, Meat would not have had one-tenth of the problems he had psychologically. And I think I would have been happier because I wanted to feel part of it more than behind the scenes. But once it happened, it happened. You know, I remember when I was thinking about it, uh, saying, well, no one's ever going to hear this record anyway. It's not going to matter. Why should I get upset about it? This is such an absurd little project. And um, so I didn't get overly freaked out. I got more probably upset about it later on, a few years later, when, I, when like when Meat lost his voice. I was thinking, this is so awkward. This whole thing is clumsy. And, and I really think it was a terrible act because I think Meat didn't want that burden on him. He didn't want to feel like... And uh, you could see that if you were with him as I was every day when we were touring. Um, the audience would chant for him and love him and it was wonderful. And I felt fine. Uh, it was great just they were loving the songs too. But I could tell it was hard for him because it's almost like he felt he had to come up with songs for the next record. And suddenly there was the split between us and we weren't like one organism I was someone like the director, and he was the actor, and it was, there was a split, and it was awkward, basically. Uh, so that was the main thing that bothered me. Um, but I don't remember ever feeling anything like love-hate on either end. Well, I loved him as a performer, but, and he was adorable <laughs> at first. I mean, me, when I first knew him, when, he changed a lot in, in a fascinating way. I mean, the character of Meat Love that he does on stage, and he's, he's very articulate about this. Um, he was always, in a strange way, very articulate before he even knew he was articulate. Um, he, he always played a character. And what the character of Meatloaf, we sort of created that character together. And I directed it, but it came out of him. I could always sense it in him. He was the sweetest person on a personal level, but you could tell there was this beast in there that Wayne could get out of the cage. And I thought that was kind of my job, to let the beast out of the cage. Uh, and the stage act was really staged, which also was very antithetical to what most rock and roll was. Then most rock and roll was all about you be spontaneous, you be yourself on stage. You know, when you mentioned the Grateful Dead, that's the perfect example of that. There was no distinction between them and their audience. Rock and roll was essentially communal. The rock and roll I saw was essentially the opposite of communal. It was ritualistic. It was like you were there and there was an altar and you were looking up at something. Uh, I didn't want anything communal. I didn't want anything to do with that rabble out there, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought it was a whole different convention. It was more theater. There was an audience and there was performers. Um, and once Meat, we would rehearse the character of Meat Love. I remember specifically, you know, I would direct him how to enter and stalk the stage like a predatory beast. And he did it brilliantly. You know, it would be rehearsed, like the actual movements, the steps, the kind of walk, 
I mean, if you saw his show the first time we ever performed, that's what he did. The costume we came up with together. And I'm proud of this stuff. You know, this is looked at in rock and roll terms generally as contrivance, not what you do. You know, you, you just go out and even now, you know, I hate to keep picking on bands now, but bands are so faceless now. And they wear the clothes that it looks like they wear every day. And I hate that. I still think the biggest loss for me is that rock and roll has lost its sense of showmanship. And, with his, and showmanship is really a, a cheaper term for mythology, lost sense of mythology. Um, you know, you don't imagine some of the great, you know, I don't imagine Jim Morrison everyday life being like he was on stage. And that's what I loved about all the 60s stuff. And um, Meatloaf, once he mastered this character, the walk and stalking the stage, and, and when he entered the first performance we ever did it for the public, he came out and he just stared and glared and stalked for two and a half minutes, maybe. It was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. He didn't make a sound. And he, you know, it was a directed show. He wasn't supposed to even speak during the show. That was one of my favorite things about it. Well, when he did speak, it was scripted. It was very ritualistic. And that, that caused tension. That was hard on him. This is where it again gets to the idea that it was Meatloaf was the billing. Uh, it really shouldn't have been Meatloaf or Jim Stein in a way. It should have been some name for some theatrical experience, you know, like Neverland, you know, come visit Neverland, starring Meatloaf or something. Um, just like Bat Out of Hell, to me, the ideal probably wouldn't have been either name. It would have been Bat Out of Hell, starring Meatloaf, written by Jim Stein. And I, that's how I saw it. It was more like a movie. Um, but we were on tour, we started touring, and the tour was an amazingly instructive thing. Uh, the first show we ever did was such a disaster, it's one of those classic legendary things. I remember in September of 77, we were walking down the street, and the record was just going to come out. And I remember Meat saying to me, uh, you know, Jimmy, we got to take this gig. Sonnenberg said it's really important. It's uh, Chicago. We'll be opening for Cheap Trick. It's a great thing. CBS wants us to do it. we got to do it. I said, well, I don't know. We haven't really gotten the stage show down right, and it's premature, and I don't think we should. He said, oh, you got you got to stop being this visionary all the time. you got to just be practical. What could go wrong? And this is like in a movie where you do a jump cut. What could go wrong to an audience viciously throwing everything they could find at us? Fruit, vegetables, you know, you name it. We were just a disaster. It was a hometown crowd that, in Chicago that came to see Cheap Trick, uh, like their homecoming. And they didn't even have us on the bill. They didn't announce us. And so they're all there to see Cheap Trick. And before Cheap Trick came out, I walk out first, all in black leather, and I do this sort of strip tease of gloves, taking rituals, and I was booed mercilessly. Boy, they hated me. I must have been pretty cool. Um, but they really hated me. And, and I'm sure Milo's in the wings, just like with Clive Davis saying, boy, they really hate Jimmy. At least I'll be out there and it'll save the show. Milo came out and boy, did they hate him. <laughs> they just, they were vicious. They were yelling out, fat boy, you know, eat a salad. <laughs> it was like the worst things they could say. And uh, mostly about how, you know, he's fat. You know, it was really insulting stuff. And shut up and stop singing. And I remember me was adorable. I'm, I'm at the piano and me comes up to me, you know, while they're saying these things and he goes, Jimmy, what do I say? They just said you're a fat pig. <laughs> and I said, uh, tell them that their mother wears army boots. <laughs> and <laughs> Meat actually, I had no idea what to say. I was playing the piano and he goes, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> he goes, your mother wears army boots. He said, shut up, you stupid fat hippo. He says, Jimmy, that didn't work. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not too good at these ad-libs then. <laughs> Let me play the piano. And they just booed us off the stage. It was a total disaster. And I remember afterward, everyone was sitting around like it was a morgue. Um, we had two guitarists, two brothers, the Kulik brothers, one of whom was in Kiss now, uh, Bob Kulik. And um, they always kept saying they were great in that they were like the old grizzled veterans because they had toured with some band. They'd always say, it's a jungle out there. It's a jungle. You guys don't know what a jungle it is. And I'd always say, ah, who cares? And then they're out there after the show, they're out there going, we told you, it's a jungle. It's a jungle. We're dead. And Sonnenberg's going, we've got to rethink this whole thing. We've got to go back. Maybe it should be just piano. We should play maybe lounges or something. We can't do this. And I was the only one, Meat remembers this, I think. I was the only one who was sort of saying, this was cool. Did you, they really hated this. I mean, this really, it was that same, I always had that reaction. Um, I wasn't totally detached from reality, but 90%. I just thought it was really cool that they hated it so much. And um, it was a complete flop. Uh, they just were not interested. And it also showed how you can't just introduce an audience to something. That was something I knew from theater. You had to prepare an audience. And um, so we were going to do no more shows like that. That's what we said. We had to headline, even though it was a new act. Because that was the usual thing. You know, you open for a bigger act. We wouldn't do that. And the main change was we decided, even if it's the tiniest clubs, we'll have to headline and do the, the show we can do. And the next time we played, 
was a place in New Jersey called Creations, a little nightclub. You know, about 300 people. And I remember Meat was so terrified to go on because he hadn't been on stage since Chicago. And he was shaking like crazy, going, I can't go out there. They're going to call me fat. I can't go out there. And everyone had to hold his hand. We had to drive around with him before the show. And he went out there, and they had just started playing the record on WNEWFM. Only two stations in America were playing the record. Uh, MMS in Cleveland and NEWFM in New York. Uh, the record took forever to get started. Uh, radio people hated it, like everyone else, and, uh, except for these two stations. And NEW was our salvation in New York, because I could hear it. It meant it existed. And there's a guy who's a legendary figure named Scott Muni, <clears throat> who's probably one of the first two or three freeform, they were called, in DJs. But everyone takes for granted now, FM radio didn't exist then. There were only a few stations, FM radio. And he was a pioneer in playing the new rock and roll, and not just playing top 40. And Scott, Scott Muni also, by the way, had one of the best uh, observations about Bat of the Hell ever when I met him years later. I said, Scott, how you doing? He goes, oh, you know that Bat of the Hell? I love that record. You know why I always played that record? I thought he was going to say because it was brilliant. I said, no, why'd you always play that? Because those songs, they were so fucking long. I could put one on, go take a dump, read the paper, still have two or three minutes to come back, wipe myself, and I was ready to go again. And I thought that was... I really treasured that. I thought that was, that was the most practical of, uh, comment I ever got from radio. And uh, they were playing the record, and we got to this place, Creations, there's 300 people or so. <coughs> and um, me and Love walked out on stage, and from the beginning of the show to the end, they sang along with every song. They knew every lyric, and they cheered everything, and you could see him physically change during the show. Uh, it was like you felt every tendon becoming inflamed, every muscle becoming resurrected, every nerve tingling, and the brain expanding, and he just stood there, and he went from being like, you know, um, Archie Bunker's wife, Gene Stapleton, <laughs> this sad sort of, you know, scared figure, to this heroic sort of Marvel Comics superhero, like that, and you could just watch it happen during one show, and he remained that, you know, he became sort of a superhero. Once he knew that the audience was... Oh no, Todd. Oh, I don't remember that. Uh, so, Jim, you were saying, what happened when the audience, once he knew the audience... Well, yeah, once he felt the pulse of the audience, he felt the audience was with him organically. It's like Batman knowing Gotham City was behind him. He could soar ten times as high. And he really became much more the Meatloaf character, which I'm sure screwed him up in his private life. Because the Meatloaf character was such an extraordinarily complex character. Now, you've got to keep in mind that, to my memory, when I first met Meatloaf, he was the sweetest farm kid. He was a kid from Texas. He did seem, in that sense, and I'm sure it's my shallow perception because I didn't know him well, he seemed almost one-dimensional. Uh, as I got to know him, I knew there was a lot more going on in the service. He had a really difficult childhood, a really difficult life with his family, ran away from home at the age of 14, I think. Um, so there's a lot more going on, but it didn't show. But that's why maybe I sensed it intuitively, and he sensed it as a performer could bring it out. This other monster could come out of the cage and be so powerful and bestial and, and predatory, but, and also funny at the same time. And there had to be this essential sweetness or it wouldn't have worked. He would have just seemed obnoxious. Or a contrivance, like an Alice Cooper, but he did. It, uh, it was real. That's why he didn't need makeup and stuff, uh, like an Alice Cooper or a Kiss. But he was just as much an extreme comic book figure in the best sense as Alice Cooper or Kiss. And um, so this show at Creations was a turning point because he felt he could have the audience with him as he always had that faith, but he had lost it from the bad show in Chicago. And what that, the problem then became, because it was billed as meatloaf, I think he felt more of, a, more of an onus to be what he thought a performer should be. And I remember early on in the tour, very early on, just probably the second month, uh, we were playing Pittsburgh a place in Pittsburgh, and um, it was the first time he veered away from the script, so to speak. And again, this is tricky, because he's thinking of himself as a performer, and what does a performer do but come out and ad-lib and talk to the audience? That was never done in our show. The way our show had been constructed, it was really scripted. There was very little talking at all, and what there was was scripted or ritualistic, like the speech on um, Hot Summer Night. You know, on a hot summer night, would you offer your throat to the wolf with the red roses, that sort of thing. Because uh, I didn't want him talking, to be honest. Uh, it wasn't as interesting, and it wasn't as mysterious. But I think he felt weird not talking. And in Pittsburgh, it, for whatever reason, it came out, and he walked out on stage, and he looked at the audience, and instead of just stalking and glaring, he turned to him and said, 
How are you mothers doing tonight? You ready to party? You ready to party hard? Pittsburgh, you ready to party? You know, and he became, to me, every other rock and roll band in the country, saying, you ready to party? You know, hey, Minneapolis. And I was just withering up. I was horrified, actually. And Sonnenberg was in the audience, and he was horrified, too. And we had a big confrontation after with Meatloaf in the, the hotel room. And uh, I remember it was really violent. He was really upset. Because to him, it was like questioning the validity of him as a person. Like, I can't talk to my own audience? Because it had become his audience, because it was his name, which is understandable. But to us, it was a scripted piece, a theater piece. And that's where the real conflict started. And it was a problem for him. And he got so upset at the idea that he couldn't say that. And to us, it was simply artistic. It wasn't interesting, him saying, you ready to party tonight? It just didn't fit this great Marvel Comics character. You know, it's like Batman saying, Hey, Gotham City, you ready to party? Hey, Robin, come on, let's boogie. It's, it didn't fit that world. It wasn't mythic at that point, and it wasn't extreme. And he went berserk in this, hotel is not the right word, motel room. He threw uh, a chair through the window, I think. He broke stuff, mirrors. And then he stalked out of the room. And uh, I remember we had to go find him. My memory of this is probably a little more colorful than it was, but it still doesn't matter. At a certain point where truth is not nearly as accurate as what you can embellish memory with. And it probably, as I remember it, it is much more representative of the real truth of the whole experience. We had to go looking for him because he had tried to take his life a few times. Never succeeded. I don't think they were meant to be successful. And one of them was when we were making the record, which has to do with Todd, which I can go into later, Todd Rundgren. <clears throat> but this time, David was justifiably concerned. He said, uh-oh, come on, we got to get a search party. He's out there. He, he could do damage to himself. He's really upset. Because like in his mind, we know he's going, I don't exist, huh? I can't say hi. I'm not worthwhile, huh? You know, it's like that kind of thing. It's like an, it's like an actor who doesn't feel, who feels he should improvise, basically. It's a strange idea, because I would talk to him all the time and say, me, so I'm Francis Coppola and you're Marlon Brando of The Godfather. Who's cooler? It's cooler to be Marlon Brando, right? But it was difficult for him with the name Meatloaf out there. And uh, so we went out looking for him. And I remember this like Night of the Living Dead, partly because it was Pittsburgh. And Night of the Living Dead was filmed in Pittsburgh. That was a big movie at the time. And I didn't realize till I had been in Pittsburgh that it was pretty much a documentary, Night of the Living Dead. So I, my, I was entranced by Pittsburgh because it was where Night of the Living Dead was filmed. I was amazed that Night of the Living Dead turned out to be so much a documentary about Pittsburgh because the people looked like that at the time. That's how it seemed to me. And we were in this real, the worst area of Pittsburgh, like a horrible, I wouldn't even describe it as a ghetto. It was more like a toxic chemical experimentation laboratory. All you saw around you were these horribly colored toxic fumes coming out of, I guess, factories or steel mills. Blue, purple, green, it was scary. It was like, you know, one of the, pure science fiction. Like, you expected mutants to emerge around every, every corner. And we're in this huge parking lot next to this motel, which was totally deserted. A deserted parking lot, fumes everywhere. And we're like a search party in the Frankenstein movie. Like, we all had flashlights, but they could have been torches. And there's like eight of us, and we're going around going, meat, meat, meat. And <laughs> what I remember as a, a nice touch was this station wagon pulls up with this little old couple that looked like a that Grant Wood painting of America, like one should have a pitch for, like the old grandma and grandpa from a commercial for Kellogg's Corn Flakes or Metamucil or something. They pull up and they were probably looking for directions. They drive up very, you know, nicely and they pull up to this group and they suddenly see eight people with flashlights going, meet, 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 and they go, never mind. <laughs> they speed out of there, having come upon this rare group of cannibals from Pittsburgh. <laughs> and um, we're looking for meatloaf, and they, we looked everywhere. And I finally got a sense that it wasn't going to be in this area. And I went all the way to the other area of the parking lot. It's like probably the length of a football field. And I see this figure crunched down in a hunched position, like a, like basically um, a running back in football. Uh, Meat was a football player, and boy, he was powerful. And he was like in this, you know, set position, down like 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 a rhino or an elephant, something about to charge. And you could always see, one thing you could always recognize me by on stage too, one of the most amazing things on stage is, and it doesn't show up on film well, but the steam that would come out of his body was like the steam that comes out of a manhole in New York from the subway system, if you're on stage, because of the amount of heat that he generates, there'd be a massive amount of steam coming out of his body. You'd think that he had like 
500 you know, Haitian workers inside his stomach, all illegally making clothes for Kathy Lee Gifford. It was just an amazing amount of steam. And you could see that in this parking lot. That's how I noticed him. There's this huge volcanic eruption of steam. And I went toward it, all the other side, and there he is, crouched down. I can't do this because I'm sitting down. But he's crouched down in this position. And I say, meat? He goes, <sighs> I say, and I figured, okay, we're having a conversation. That's good. I said, are you okay, meat? He says, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a Frankenstein monster. I'm me. I'm meat off. I'm not your Frankenstein monster. I said, no, I know meat. Now I'm Francis Coppola. I said, <sighs> and meanwhile, way on the other side of the parking lot, where there's a truck stop, which is also right out of Night of the Living Dead, there's this huge truck. I don't even know what the right term is, but it's the, one of those enormous trucks that you get a small country into. And it had that amazing front that someone spent a lot of time on where they did a customized front with the special fenders, and it had a devil's head, huge devil's head on the front. And the fenders had been made, I hope I'm using the right term, but the things, basically, you know, the breasts, the huge nipples that stick out, they were turned into these amazingly sharp fangs. So there are two fangs on either side, a devil's head. This is the perfect truck. And the guy had gone in to get, you know, hostess Twinkies or whatever these satanic truck drivers eat. And so it was empty, the truck. He's not in the truck, and it's just out there idling, and meat is aimed directly at those fenders. I could see. He goes, I'm not the Frankenstein monster. <laughs> and, I, and I realized, well, I shouldn't interfere with this. Something's coming. And I just moved aside, and he charged, like, <laughs> excuse me, lost an eyeball. And, um, like, it seemed like 100 miles an hour. He charged in his crouched position, like a football player. He would make Marcus Allen envious. And when full force, had to go at least 100 yards, gathering up speed. And he's a fast, strong guy. Uh, and rammed headfirst into that truck, into the sharp, piercing fender. And I remember the forehead exploding, blood pouring out like firecrackers. And all I remember thinking was, God, look at the way the red of the blood mixes with the fumes of green and purple and the devil's head. And, you know, it was like a wonderful image to me. Uh, I had obviously lost touch with reality, too. And he just crashed, and the truck was far more damaged than me. He just had to get, you know, stitches or something, which is not so unusual for him. Um, but that was our confrontation about, uh, you know, the scripted show. And as I remember, he went back to the scripted show for a while, but then gradually had to make it more of his way to talk to the audience and kind of found a balance. But that was kind of metaphorically, I think, what he went through a lot for the next 20 years, whether he was Meatloaf, the character, for which he didn't have someone to write material because he wasn't that person, or was he Meatloaf the person who would never be so predatory and monstrous on stage? And I think it became difficult. It's the old story of, um, what's that old movie, A Double Life or something, where someone's playing the part of Othello and they start becoming the part and end up killing their own wife. It's like the, the blur between reality and the part he was playing. And much more so in this because it wasn't a movie. It wasn't like it was Othello, it was Meatloaf. It was his name. His real name, strange enough, being Meatloaf, was also the name of the Marvel comic superhero, rock and roll, icon, mythic character he was playing. It had to be confusing, you know. Jim Steinman wasn't confusing. That was just what I was. But it was definitely confusing for him, I think. Um, but it was exciting to see all these shows. And, uh, and it was also an interesting lesson what you could do. I mean, it showed that it was still an uphill battle, even with the artists, to do rock and roll as theater that um, it was an interesting thing to witness. But, um, and we went from there and did a show in Philadelphia, which is known almost legendarily in certain circles as the Battle of Philly, opening actually for Southside Johnny, which was the band that Miami Steve was in. And um, it was one of the few shows we opened for anyone, but we, we, it was an important one because WMMR, the big station in Philadelphia, was broadcasting it live. So it was important exposure for us. And there was so many things that went wrong, I won't bore you with them, but. They were really sorry they let us use the piano. I, uh, we didn't have our own piano. So I said, it's all right if we use your grand piano rather than some horrible little piano the theater has. They said, oh yeah, use our piano. They didn't realize how hard I played. <laughs> I played ridiculously hard on the piano. It comes from you know, wanting to bleed. And uh, I played so hard that six keys flew out of the piano. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. It just, you saw this key just fly out. The string broke and then the key gets ricocheted out. And they couldn't, do the, they couldn't use their piano for their show, <laughs> and they were furious. But then when me came out, the one thing they warned them about, they said, look, this is going out on the air live. 
don't curse, we don't have a delay going, it's broken, so just control yourself. And I swear, the very, you'll have to bleep it. But Meatloaf comes out and he goes, how you doing, you motherfuckers? Philadelphia, motherfucking Philadelphia. He just says motherfucking about 40 times in a row. And it was from there, it was downhill, because he was still upset from Washington. He was totally, I think, drunk, and he poured a bottle of gin, I think, on, over the head of Steve Buslow, the bass guitarist. While he's playing the bass guitar, it could have electrocuted him. He was throwing beer bottles behind him. They were crashing and breaking against the drums. It was really like a danger zone. But that was always the case. Doing a show with me was always a dangerous occurrence. I mean, I mean that literally. There's always a chance of physical danger. Because he was, in a way, a very scary thing. A guy who did not have any conscious inhibitions when he was on stage. And that could be dangerous for the other people. Even just the sound level, I remember we got so scared at one point, I, he had the loudest monitors ever, I think, for his vocals. And they were on the side, and they were right next to me on the piano, literally maybe three feet away, as his vocal monitor. His vocal monitor was just his voice, which he needed, because he has hard of hearing in one ear. And uh, it's all top. He wanted heavy treble. So it's unbelievably bright, loud vocal. To make you understand how loud it is, they, they tested KISS, Gene Simmons told me, and KISS was, I I might not have the number exactly right, but it was something like 143 dB or something. It was what a jet plane is taking off, KISS was clocked at, um, which was amazing, you know, because it permanent damage to your ears and all that. They did it for us, and we were like 8 dB hotter for the band. But the amazing thing is, I asked them would they do the monitor, and the monitor was something like 160 dB, just the monitor. So I had the equivalent of a jet plane plus like 100 people screaming in my ear. Uh, for months, and I got really nervous. I remember I went to a doctor in Detroit who told me my hearing was perfect. But then again, he was a doctor in Detroit. <laughs> who knows? But um, it was really a diff it was an ordeal every night, the show. I mean, for a lot of physical reasons. Did you quit the tour? I had to stop. I had to stop after a year to write. Uh, I was exhausted. That was part of it. But I can't write on the road. I don't know how people do that. And uh, there was a second album to prepare for. And so I left the road after about a year to write, uh, and someone replaced me. It was, it was funny the, what it was like on tour for that first time with Meat Love. One story that really reflects a lot is that Meat was really caring about me. He really could tell that I was going through hell. And I cared about him. We both knew we were going through hell, but we couldn't stop it. And David was in charge, and David was doing what he felt the manager had to do, you know, flog the product. So he wouldn't lay up on the schedule. We were trying to get him to ease up, because Meat had lost his voice. He had lost his voice so bad at one place in Omaha, uh, well, it, it was Omaha, that um, he couldn't speak before the show. He said, I can't talk, Jimmy. I'm going to do the show anyway. He said, why? I can't, I can't cancel. I can't cancel. I'm going to do the show. So he does this show without being able to talk, but faking it. It still made it work for sheer will and dramatic presence. Um, and when it's over, he did the same thing. He's fainted and he pulls me close to my I did it. I did it. I didn't sing, but I did it. I got it. it was like, it was both heroic and appalling. Um, the audience sang along. They knew everything. It was sort of a lesson, too, about concerts that the audience comes prepared. Um, but it got worse from there, and they couldn't cancel things. You know, he'd get, he'd get his voice back, but lose it again. And there was one point halfway through the tour where, I forget where we were, but, um, Oh yeah, we were in Canada, so it was something like Toronto or Montreal. It was a big hockey stadium. Again, we were bigger in Canada, so we were playing like 20,000 people. In Canada, we would still be playing a small place in New York, in uh, America. And uh, before we went on, I guess I was at the table eating something like something in Oliver Twist. I probably looked like one of those kids eating the gruel. I was just in slow motion, like, uh, uh, and me comes over really concerned, very sweet, and goes, Jimmy, you're dead, aren't you? You're really tired. I'm exhausted, me. What about you? He says, I'm beyond dead, but I gotta keep going. Huh? You know, tomorrow night's Albany. I said, oh no, don't say that, Albany. So you don't want to play Albany, do you? I said, I can't, me. We gotta stop, Albany. It's just, if we have to, we have to, but I sure don't like it. And I kept eating my gruel, and we went on that stage, and it was one of the most amazing concerts, because it was in this hockey rink. They had a huge Ray stage that they put up, about, you know, maybe 15, 20 feet off the floor. And we're performing on it. And when it comes time doing the encore, which was River Deep Mountain High, meets at the back of the stage, and, and I look in his eyes, and I always felt intuitively I knew what he was thinking. And maybe delusional, but I thought it. I said, 
that guy is going to do something now. I know it. Because when we had a talk right before the show, he said, I'm going to get us out of Albany. We're not going to play Albany. I'm not going to put you through that. I'm not going to go through it. I said, you can't, me. You already talked to David. He's not going to cancel it. They're not going to tell me what I can do. This is my life. I control my life. I can cancel my own life. And, you know, I said, whoa. He's going to do something tonight. And that night, during River Deep Mountain High, he goes running like a stallion. It doesn't stop at the edge of the stage. Just runs off the stage and falls pow, in a complete jumbled mess on the floor. Like a 20 foot drop. And you look down, and I could see it from where I was at the piano, and you saw a leg totally twisted, where you know it's been broken in about 80 spots. Like the knee is parallel to the thigh. It's just horrible looking. And all the medics, and we just kept playing. We we're so used to anything, we never stopped playing. We just finished the song, instrumentally and walked off stage. <laughs> we just, just like when I saw David choking him, or him choking David. Nothing surprised me, you know, nothing shocked me. So we kept playing, and, and then a guy named Sam Ellis, who was the tour manager, comes backstage, and we're all getting dressed in the lockers, and Sam says, okay, he's like in this really frenetic mood. He says, all right, this is really bad. Um, I don't want to tell you, his leg is badly broken. All I can say is it's broken in a lot of spots, gonna require surgery, I can't get a lot of people to the hospital. I can only take maybe three people. No one raised their hands. And it wasn't that we were callous. We just had to get out of there. <laughs> you know, and it just, nothing was quite real in this tour. And no one raised their hands. Just, I can take three people. And it's like he was recruiting then. <laughs> Anyone want to come? And finally I raised my hand. He says, you want to come, Jim? And I said, no, I, I really don't want to come, but I, I just have a question. Is there any more food? Because that gruel was terrible. Is there anything else to eat? He says, this guy has a broken leg. I know, I know, but I'm really hungry. <laughs> and I just went back to the uh, motel, and later we found we had to cancel about a month because of his leg, which was a blessing in disguise. And interesting enough, when we came back, we did a, a gig at Queens College, New York, that I think is one of the best shows I ever saw Meatloaf do. And one of the reasons is he did in a wheelchair, in a cast, in a wheelchair. And it was, it was kind of like watching Franklin Delano Roosevelt with Iron Maiden. It was so weird to see a guy in a wheelchair, but it means he couldn't run around the stage. So it was just the music, just him singing it, and it was magnificent. You know, it didn't have all the theatricality, but he's still so theatrical and dramatic. And vocally, it was much better, because he could just concentrate on that. But that was the only break we had in the tour. And he kept touring way after I left, until his voice went so ragged, that's why he couldn't do a second album right away. He was just screwed up. <laughs>